with Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program. And uh, we are so grateful that you join us each uh, Sunday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. and Monday mornings at 1 a.m., as well as the morning broadcast on Wednesdays, 9 a.m. So we are glad that you join us for those programs. Hope that you learn something. You're entertained as well as educated and uh, inspired uh, to take action in your own life, to transform your life uh, and the lives of the people around you. You say, I can't transform anybody else's life. Ah, but you can, because by your transforming your life, changing your life, making those adjustments in your life, you actually do affect the people around you. We are connected, whether you like it or not. Hey, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Pandemic. If you don't think we're connected, you better take a look around you, uh, because we do affect the lives of the people around us. America has lost over 700,000 human beings, human beings, people that you and I used to walk the streets with, work with, go to church and play with, uh, have dinner with, and so forth. So we need to remember that we are uh, connected. Today's program, I think you're going to enjoy uh, as we move forward here. I'll give you all the particulars about the program and what have you later, but. Um, Ken Gosnell is my guest, and uh, the book that he has right now is called Well Done. We're going to be talking about that book and uh, the the aspects therein. Ken, first of all, thank you so much for joining us here on the program. It's really a pleasure to have you with us. Well, thank you, Richard. I'm delighted to be here, and I love your show. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's, it is one of those things that uh, this particular subject that we're going to go into is one that, uh, and it is kind of funny in a way that we kind of, I, I kind of went off on a, a rant before we started. <laughs> uh, but it, it still ties into what we're talking about because the kinds of uh, issues that, that I'm dealing with, everybody's dealing with, but from a lot of different perspectives and you being a leading, uh, that uh, you, you leading a business uh, it you know it can be hard. It can be difficult. I I don't actually have one. I did in 1994. I actually had a business for one year. Then I filed my taxes. Then I owed the IRS three thousand dollars. Then I shut the business down. And I said the next time I start a business, I'm going to have a CPA on hand to take care of this, so I don't owe money to the IRS. But that's only one of those areas of challenge uh, in a business. And uh, we're here to talk about that through the book that you have written called Well Done. Um, first of all, uh, in terms of, I mean, we're, we're talking not just about money. We are talking about doing business. Um, somebody has said many times, uh, Ken, for, uh, you know, and I want to tie this in a little bit, that uh, government cannot be run by like a business because that's not what it is. And yet we have people who have been in the office who try to do that. Uh, and, and, and many, many people say that the, the and I guess this is, this is attributed to Ronald Reagan, who said that the, 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 the one phrase you never want to hear is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Right. And there's nothing but uh, denigration and name calling and all that kind of stuff. But I'll tell you, if I hear, hi, I'm from a corporation and I'm here to help. I take the same attitude because of the way corporations have operated here in California. And I'm not sure where you live, but I live here in California. I moved from Arizona. Uh, and of course, uh, we have regulations, uh, Ken. I, I, I use this analogy. You're on a chessboard. You're in the middle of a chessboard. And here are the rules. You can't move forward. You can't move backward, you can't move to the left, and you can't move to the right, and you can't go diagonally. And the final rule, you can't stay where you are. <laughs> well, here's, here's the kicker that I think a lot of people have forgotten when it comes to, and again, regulations that do impact businesses and government and so forth. The reason regulations even started is because businesses refused in the late 18 and early 1900s to do the right thing. Why do you think we have child labor laws and ADA and the list goes on of some of those good ones? Now, Ken, would you agree with me? Hey, regulations have gone completely berserk, right? Gone way over the top. Right. Um, and this is just one area. Then you've got your financial aspect in business. I mean, there's so many areas. And you've written this book called Well Done. 
that basically tells us, uh, you know, I want to get to the end of my life, my business. Let's say I sell it or, you know, I want to retire and, you know, I did good. I did good by the people who I worked with and who worked for me. I did good by my customers. I can, uh, Harry Chapin once uh, told a story of his, uh, of his grand, I think it was his grandfather, who basically talked about a good tired and a bad tired. Hmm. And uh, it was that good tired that he really focused on because he says, I fought my battles, I did my thing, I did the right thing here and there, and I can put my head down on the pillow and I can say, I am good tired and sleep the, the, sleep, the sleep of the just. Hmm. And I'm ready to go. Uh, and yet we keep hearing these stories about one company after another just, can I put it this way, shafting. Yeah. The public, the consumer, this person and that person. Where did you begin when it came to putting this together in terms of uh, coming to the end, if you will, where you would hear, hey, great job, well done, thank you so much for being of service. Absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to rewrite the script for business and one of the uh, key indicators that you you were just mentioning was the lack of um, or the loss of trust, the lack of belief that a lot of employees, a lot of communities, a lot of individuals have in in corporations and in big business uh, today. And so, um, what I found was I began to do research and to think about uh, successful businesses. And I meant what I mean by that, we're not just profitable businesses, but businesses that really made a difference in the lives of individuals over the last hundred years and companies that had showed a track record over a long period of time, like a company like JC Penney, that's been in existence almost 120, 20 years. Wow. Um, and what I found was quite interesting because I, I, I wanted to look at businesses that were successful over the long haul and what did it take to be successful, not just for a day, but for a season or, or maybe for multiple seasons, if you will, if you think about, uh, you know, over a hundred years. And one of the principles that I challenge business owners to think about is to have that, what I call four generation uh, thinking, a hundred year kind of mentality. So don't make decisions just based in the short term, but make decisions on the long term. And what I found was that uh, as I looked at the landscape of, of businesses and business leaders, CEOs and business owners, because the business would often reflect the values or the principles of the leader. And um, what I found was that there were certain principles that begin to, to elevate or to rise. And um, I'm of Christian faith, and so I, I map those principles back to uh, the Bible and God's Word, and I found that some of the best business books, some of the best principles, some of the best businesses were really rooted and grounded in what, what I call biblical business principles. And so I call myself a business Christian today. You know, we can have different philosophies or different ideas, and, and what I mean by that is that somebody that looks at biblical concepts or biblical ideas and how does that apply to to business decisions and there's a story in the bible that my father used to tell me when i was a kid now my father uh, has an interesting story in, in itself he was the oldest of six children and in the 1950s when he was 15 years old his his dad was pursuing a dream they'd moved him out of the city of st louis went to buy a, a farm and he really that was his father's dream my grandfather's dream and but in the meantime, while they tried to get the farm up and running, he went to work a construction crew and, um, you know, road crew, and they were repairing a road one day and a drunk driver came through and, and actually ran over my grandfather, killed him on the spot. Wow. And so my father went to work at the age of 15, quit high school, went to work and actually went to a company that's still in existence today, been in a company that's almost 75 years old. Um, practice some of these principles. So my father used to teach me this story about well done because it come, he learned it in the Bible. There's a story about a, a, a business owner or a leader that left and had three employees and he gave some, some funds to each of the employees and said, hey, go put it to work. And when he came back, uh, a couple of the employees had done really well and, and the leader said, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's where this, the, this terminology is well done. So I look at these principles 
as values that can really change the landscape of business when we come back and find some of these uh, key principles that will guide the decisions in every aspect of their of their business so i've been um, working with companies now for the last 20 years on these principles we just released the book earlier this year um, but i've been teaching these principles for a number of years and helping companies to really re rewrite um, how they do business and and for the ceo how they lead you know, and to me, that is so important. I have one, I'm going to consider it to be a crucial question. Uh, and, and you made the, the, I think, a very, very nice phrase, turn of phrase there about how, you know, we all have our different philosophies, our different beliefs and so forth. Will this book and the principles that you've outlined, as you've stated, the biblical principles, um, be a, a, something that someone who may not be a believer, a Christian, they can use too, because there was something that, that struck me back in 2005. I was working for a, a progressive station, Air America Phoenix, and it was bought by a Christian consortium that also bought the Christian station that I had worked for the, for the previous 15 years. And they told the newspapers in 2005, when asked, are you going to change the format? And they said, oh, no, 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 we wouldn't. They're successful. They're making money and so forth. Uh, and uh, we had made, we had actually broken even. We were the first station, Air America station across the country to break even in nine months, not a year, nine months. And they said, oh, no, we're not going to change the format. As soon as I heard that, I knew they lied. They lied to the public and to the reporter because I knew enough after working for 15 years at the Christian station uh, the one passage that kept coming up for me, and this is sort of where I'm going with this, uh, uh, Ken. Be ye not unequally yoked to non-believers. Well, February 28th of 2020, uh, 2006 was my last day mm. because they were changing the format. <laughs> right. Yep. Uh, and I was ready for it. I mean, you know, as I, you, I could see the writing on the wall when all of this was unfolding because oh. I knew how this this business works so and and I, I maybe maybe it's changed i haven't been involved in the the inner circle if you will since two, 1995 okay when i was working in christian broadcasting from 1980 to 95. Uh, so i don't know how things have changed within um i would hope that they've they've shifted a little to say look our principles they're great for us but, you know, we can even go back to, uh, to Jesus. He didn't come here for the pure, for the clean, for the saints. He came here for the quote unquote sinners. Right. The church wasn't for the saints. It was for the sinners, which always perplexed me when I would hear denigrations of different groups of people by the televangelists of the 80s and early 90s. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh boy, have you guys missed it. Um, so is your book for everybody yeah it is uh, the way i wrote the book was each of the principles that i talk about i put it in business uh, vernacular if you will so one of the principles uh, it, it's not uh principles that are the the do's and don'ts if you will it's more principles that are guiding values so one of the principles that i would teach in the book that i think a lot of unfortunately christian businesses and individuals across the, the landscape maybe of our land have forgotten is that what I call a principle of knowing your yeses and nos, right? And I talk about the clarity that comes from that. Jesus, I get this out of the, the, the gospel account of Matthew. There was mm -hmm. a story where Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that that principle is really important where it comes to uh, leadership from a CEO, from a business owner, from a business itself. And what I remind leaders today is I say, hey, when you're clear, when the, when the leader is clear, everyone and everybody and everything in the organization becomes clear. And uh, so, you know, that's a principle that I believe any person can embrace and begin to apply it into their life. And of course, we're really wanting them to apply it into their businesses. I found that I went, I did a lot of uh, working with companies of various sizes over the last 20 years or so. and. One of the biggest aspects of that is I would go in and we'd help clean up some messes that were created because 
folks that were told or there was uncertainty uh, that was being communicated from the top down. And there was a lack of trust about, hey, what, who do we believe in and who do we want to follow? And I think that's happening in our world today, even when we look at the political realm of, um, you know, um, all the pandemic and mandates that are being put down and all these things. And when, when employees or teams know their leader's clarity, when they know their yeses, and they know what the leader is going to say no to, then that's a leader that people want to follow. And I think that's true whether you're a Christian or whether you're whatever belief that you might be. So that's part of that. I wanted to, this leadership book uh, in a in business book, I, I tried to come at it from a little different perspective because I did want to highlight the, the business principles. I wanted to show an authenticity of where I believe that was in the scriptures or the Bible to show that this was a principle that's been true for thousands of years and it's been practiced in multiple generations by a variety of different leaders. But I do believe that but anybody could pick up this book. As a matter of fact, I've had multiple people that have picked up the book that weren't Christian and they said, man, I, I just so thankful for this book because it's so practical, it's so helpful. It's not only helped me in business, but it's also helped me to, in life in an organization that I'm running or just to, you know, even as I'm thinking about my own personal life. So you don't have to be a Christian to understand the principles of the book or even to apply the principles. My guest today is Ken Gosnell. He's the author of Well Done, 12 Biblical Business Principles for Leaders to Grow Their Business with Kingdom Impact. All right, we can certainly uh, live with that and, and work with that, and I hope we will. The website you want to go to uh, to get more information about the book, welldonebook.com. That's welldonebook.com. And uh, your website uh, that we want to send people to is ceoexperience.com. We'll be linked to, to those, and you're also all over social media as well. And we are uh, going to continue here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and I thank you so much for being with us here, along with Ken Gosnell. Uh, his book is well done. You know, I have to tell you that it's always nice to hear those words or words to that effect. Um, matter of fact, uh, uh, you know what springs to mind? It was a, a Veterans Day, uh, and it was, oh, I don't even remember the year now. Uh, maybe it was 2000. Yeah, it was uh, 2000, because I was working for uh, a, a station, and we had a morning man who was on from 6 to 10. I was his producer behind the console. And uh, the uh, program director of days earlier said, look, here's what we want to do with our Veterans Day show. We want to get all of these different veterans. We had Deacon Cini on. I think we had McCain on at that time and so on and so forth. And um, he says, and our morning man was very intellectual, very much in the head, very cerebral, great guy, Christian as well, uh, you know, and not that that makes that much difference. He was really good at his job. I do have to say he's since passed away, and I, I was very sad about that because I wanted to touch base with him again, see how he was doing. I now know. Anyway, and he says, uh, what we want to do is we want to we want to bring out um, Austin's um, emotion. OK, he's very good at doing, you know, very intellectual, but we want him to be more human, so to speak. OK, not, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So and we do the entire show. It goes flawlessly. Absolutely one of the best programs that I've ever been a part of. And at the end of the show, Austin is in there wrapping up and all of a sudden he starts to break down. And I'm going, we didn't want to make him, I mean, I'm just saying to myself, we didn't want to make him cry, you know. Well, my boss, the program director, walks into the control room, walks right in front of me in the glass where I can see Austin, puts out his hand, stretches out his hand, shakes my hand and says, four stars, mm. and shook my hand. And I have, I actually recorded that whole four hours. I've got it at home on a disc. That's awesome. That was an awesome feeling now i knew that it was a great show whether he came in there and did that or not i mean i could feel it inside oh my gosh it was so exciting i can still feel it today um unfortunately in our businesses today we're not getting that mm -hmm. from the people above us or sometimes even next to us and I have to tell you very honestly, and you would probably agree with me from your personal experience, I wouldn't be here talking with you right now, Ken, 
if it weren't for literally thousands of people who have been involved in my life and my career for the past 40 plus years, let alone my parents for the last 61 years. How does someone who feels like they're being ignored, unappreciated and so forth, how does one foster that within themselves if they're by themselves in that respect? Because you know as well as I do that what can really set in is this feeling of, well, they don't pay me enough and they don't this and that. So I, I'll take the stapler and then I'll take this. Motorola back in uh, 85, I heard the news story laid off a thousand people because they found a, a, after a, 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 an audit, a million dollars worth of materials had been pilfered. Yeah. So, so talk to us a little bit about the principles that would apply to someone who is not being appreciated and they are doing a good job they are giving their all they're committed to what they're doing yeah i say well done is, is the two most powerful words in the english language it's the two words every leader should speak and um, every leader wants to hear and i use leader in a broad perspective on that as from any any individual because you're leading uh yourself mm -hmm. and so i'm on this well done mission right that i really want companies to to think about um organizing their organization that way. I want the leaders to inspire their people by communicating these well-done principles. I want every team member um, that's part of the organization to embrace these principles. And what I would say is, and what I've lived out in my own journey, uh, obviously I wrote the book specifically towards leaders and business leaders specifically. But again, I've had people that uh, are not a CEO that's picked up the book and uh, I believe the way I wrote it was that it was really to inspire any person that wanted to live at that higher level. And what I would say is that, you know, well done, although we love to hear it from ex externally, it really comes up from us internally. Yeah. And that was what my father taught me years ago. You know, um, he would look at me and he would say that, um, hey, you know, looks like you did a great job, but only you know if you did your best job if you did your best work, right? And what he was trying to communicate to me was it really, it was, it's good to hear the words well done from somebody else. It's significant when we say to ourselves at the end of the day, I, I did the very best that I could. And that's what these principles talk about. So knowing my yeses and noes is one of those. Another principle that I write about in the book is, I say know your order, work your order. Um, so often in life, in business, and what I re reference is every business is built on processes. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a step-by-step -step process to everything within the business. And the more successful the business, usually uh, the better the process or the more thought out the process or, the, you know, there are more processes that are, that are um, developed or enhanced in the, in the business. You yeah. walk into a Starbucks today, for example, and it may seem simple, but they have a process of how they take your order and how they write your name on the cup and mm -hmm. how they pass it down and, and how, you know, who gets the coffee first, whether it's the drive through or whether it's the, <laughs> <laughs> it's the, you've got your Starbucks, I do too. I, I do. do, I know, it's bad. <laughs> but there's an order to that, right? I couldn't resist. That's right, that's right. And you know, uh, my boss, ahead has set up. I've been working with him here in Santa Barbara for 15 years. Mm -hmm. All right. And he has set up some protocols. Mm -hmm. Now it's just he and I. Mm -hmm. So there are only two sets of eyes looking at what we're doing, but he set up. They're not exactly redundancies, but they help each of us to catch the other. And there is never any blame or criticism for catching the other. Yep. Because the whole point is to catch these things before they ever leave the office. That's right. That's right. Uh, and um, and so so uh, uh, it's one of those things where you don't have to. It isn't a question of developing a thick skin. Right. It's a question of changing your perspective. What's the goal here? Well, That's the right. goal here is to serve the co the the the, uh, the the programmers, the advertisers, as well as the listeners. Okay, mm -hmm. and my the the key phrase that he has hammered home to me, even after fifteen years, Richard, we're here to serve. Period. Mm -hmm. Now we're a secular commercial station, mm -hmm. but we're still here to serve. We're here to develop relationships with both the 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 uh, buying 
public that comes in to buy airtime. I still love. <laughs> I still love from City Slickers, Billy Crystal's comment to his wife because he was selling advertising for a radio stage. He says, I sell air. That's all. I sell air. You know, <laughs> we breathe it. I'm selling air. You know, it's like that's what he's selling in a manner of speaking. But it is it is fascinating to to have worked here. Um, I, I learned a lot from one of my the, the Christian general manager back in 19 in the 80s. And unfortunately, and I want you to talk to us about this as we continue here, I want you to talk to us in just a moment about what he tried to instill in me that I couldn't, I couldn't buy. The law of diminishing returns. Don't put out any more than you expect to get back. And expect to talk about that as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. Ken Goslin, uh, Gosnell is my guest. His book is Well Done, 12 Biblical Business Principles for Leaders to Grow Their Business with Kingdom Impact. And uh, let me ask you folks a question before we uh, get to my question to Ken about the law of diminishing returns. Do you feel stuck and alone because you feel like you have to be on the one that does everything for your business? I can raise my hand and say, sometimes I do, and I do do a lot of stuff around here that three people should be doing, but it's okay. I've managed to set up uh, protocols. Ever wish you could spend one full day with either entrepreneurs, CEOs, other entrepreneurs, CEOs, business owners, leaders, um, leading their business, uh, leading their best ideas, uh, actually learning their best ideas so that you don't have to recreate the wheel on everything in in the business. Well, we're going to find out more about that as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I am here with Ken Gosnell, author of Well Well Done. Boy, I tell you what, we, we do need to hear that. And let me just say, Ken, sincerely well done on the book because, and on, on your, your attitude, your perspective, because of what I said at the, at the outset of this program and, and my experiences back in the 80s, early 90s, that you have a genuine concern and a genuine heart for the people. The people. It doesn't matter what they believe, mm -hmm. what their political affiliation is, what their economic status is. It doesn't matter where they live and so on and so forth. You're just trying to help. You're trying, and, and in your way, you're serving. Talk to us about the law of diminishing returns that my boss back in the 80s, early 90s tried to instill in me, and I just couldn't buy it. Well, I think it's right. I mean, law of diminishing returns is a, is a business concept or idea that if we give too much effort to a particular area, we're not seeing our, our best and highest value uh, that's given to that. I would change the paradigm on that a little bit. And one of the principles that I, I write about in chapter four of the book is what I say, make the move from owner to overseer. And the idea, and I'm specifically writing to business owners, but I think it's true of any person. The Bible speaks a lot about the idea of servant leadership. And I like to use the term steward leadership. Thank you. Stewardship to me means that I'm given a task or a portion of a task for a period of time. And most likely, you know, we talked about businesses being in existence for 100 years, right? So most likely a business or a task may outlive me, meaning that I may work on it for a little while and then I'm gonna hand it off to somebody else. That's that's what I call stewardship. I, I see who's done work before me and I build on that work and I build it in such a way that I can hand it off to somebody else. And so I don't really like the law of diminishing returns. I rather think about it in terms of Am I a good steward of the work that I'm doing? Am I doing it with diligence of today so that um, I, I can do it in such a way that I believe it's my best effort to do it? Am I passing it off to the next person so that they're set up for success, not set up for failure? And those are the questions that should help me to evaluate whether, I'm, whether I should continue to work on that or not. Because I believe that in business, there's another law that I principle or practice in the book is I call it the law of sowing and reaping, right? The, you have a seed and you plant it and, you know, have crops that grow up. In the Bible, there's a story about that that says a planter had some seeds and some of that crop grew 60, 80, and 100 fold. I mean, 100 times the seed that was planted. 
Mm. So, you know, the law of diminishing returns is hard because maybe that's down. A bit of effort is going to produce a hundred times return. And we're guessing that it's actually diminishing returns. It may not be diminishing returns. So I really like to change the framework of that to say, is this a good stewardship? Is this the best effort of what I'm supposed to be working on in this moment? Or am I called to go do something else? Yeah. That maybe I'm being asked to do that's going to be a great benefit, but then I'm evaluating it from a stewardship perspective. Yeah. Well, here's another area I want to talk about as we continue here, and that has to do with uh, uh, our, our inner voice, if you will. And we're talking with Ken Gosnell. He is the author of Well Done. I'm Richard Dugan. This is Tell Me Your Story. We are bringing you new paradigms for a new world, giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true here on the program as we talk with Ken Gosnell, author of Well Done. And uh, there are 12 different, uh, 12 uh, biblical principles, if you will. And although the phrase well done has a noble connotation to it, many business leaders, including Ken Gosnell, our guest here on the program, have a difficult time describing and defining what those words look like in the lives of a business that is led by a person of faith. In Well Done, our guest uh, uh, create, takes and describes the 12 biblical uh, business principles that can help any leader to uh, desire who desires to grow their business and the kingdom impact and its kingdom impact. And these principles uh, help to create a strategic roadmap for leaders to hear the words well done at the end of their journey. And every leader deserves to hear the words well done. I would say they deserve to hear those words, Ken, only if they've actually done well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think of some of the stories through history and, and recent history, the last 150 or so years. I think about people like J.P. Morgan and Tesla and the story. I don't know if it's true or not, but the story that um, because J.P. had so much money invested in copper, there was no way he was going to let Tesla succeed uh, in his endeavors um, to be able to get electricity right out of the air. I mean, his machine just basically, you know, took to and, and see, that's the other thing, too, is science has proven that everything is energy. Everything is energy, every molecule. Our bodies will decay, but the energy that holds those uh, subatomic particles together, it's not going away. It's just going to reconfigure those molecules uh, down the road into something else, into maybe a tree, some grass. Uh, we, we just don't know. Anyway, uh, so uh, we're kind of talking about that. But I would like to talk about something we talk about regularly on this program, Ken. We talk about... The decade of perfect vision, the 2020s, mm -hmm. we are encouraging people to go within into that quiet, peaceful, calm space. Some might refer to it as their closet. OK, you talk about uh, praying in secret and private. OK, and listening to that still small voice. Now, I myself refer to the still small voice that I'm listening to as my friend. And uh, you, uh, you can uh, elaborate on this if you'd like, that I do not believe that the still small voice will ever put you in harm's way. It will challenge you, but never put you in harm's way. And the more you follow the promptings, it's not that the easier your life will be, but that's what it's there for, to guide you, mm -hmm. to lead you. How does one in business, and this is sort of off-putting to the secular world, okay, uh, when you hear even a president say, God spoke to me and said, and I remember some words sort of to that effect from uh, George Jr., George Bush Jr., mm -hmm. who made a comment to that effect. Uh, and I know that a lot of, uh, maybe a lot of Christians kind of cringe. Oh, don't say it that way. <laughs> but... But the reality is that if we're listening to and following those promptings, in a matter of speaking, yes, we are. But it's just for us. That's just, just for us. It's not, I'm, hey, I'm not going to tell you, Ken, God told me to tell you, da 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 Because I have a direct line, and hey, I'll even take a collect call. <laughs> okay? Share with us your perspective. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, whether you call it your gut instinct or whether it's a still small voice or... 
a whisper in your ear, an angel on your shoulder. I mean, it can be lots of different uh, connotations of that. And I do believe that that leader, and we ought to trust the inner spirit. Now, sometimes, whether we're a leader or we're by ourselves, we begin to doubt and we begin to question whether that's reality or not. Mm -hmm. And that's why um, I, another one of the principles that I really elevate is what I, I call principle 10. I say, improve your team to improve your organization. Mm -hmm. And the team starts with us as a leader. So improve your instincts, improve your gut, improve your vision, improve your mindset, improve your mind. But then the team can go from an outer perspective as well. And, and what I find is, and what I found in a lot of business leaders, is that if they can present an idea to their team, whether that's an external team or an internal team, and they're doing it with clarity, then the team can reaffirm that still small voice or can challenge the still small voice and you become more committed to your yeses and nos to walk that out with passion because you believe in your own certainty that this is the path that we should take. And when a leader does that, then people are going to follow along and they're still going to support the leader's vision. But I believe that's, that's part of the reason, um, part of the role that we do at CEO Experience is I bring together CEOs and business owners in what I call retreats because I want them to listen to that still small voice in their mind. I want them to get away from their business for a day, to be able to hear their self, to hear what their inner self is telling them, and then to reaffirm that in the presence of other CEOs or business owners or uh, chief experience officers is what I call our role in that ah. philosophy. Um, and what I find is when that happens, I mean, I was just at a retreat yesterday and I had two of the CEOs that were there that was just talking about the decisions that they had made over the last six or seven months, even in the midst of a pandemic. And they said that because they were able and they had the courage to make that decisions because of the support of the other business owners in the team, that their companies had reached new peaks and new heights that they never even dreamed before. One matter of fact, one guy said, man, I wish I'd have done this 15 years ago because my company could be where it, you know, it could have been my, where it is today 15 years ago if I'd have had a, a group like this that helps me to understand myself and understand what, what I'm trying to accomplish. And of course, we don't like to live in regret. We like to live in the future. But I thought that statement was so profound because it wasn't necessarily the wisdom of the group that was so profound. What it was was his own wisdom that the group just reaffirmed and they gave him confidence to walk out that vision in his in his life and in his business. But yeah, I believe in the still small voice. I think that most of us, we get uh, distracted or disorganized because we don't understand what our purpose and our vision is and we don't have that clarity in our life. And so it's important to separate a little bit in order to make sure that we're listening to that inner spirit. Many people have shared with me um, that, uh, you know, I need to do this and that and the other thing, you know, uh, with the program, monetize it and so forth. And, and I've, I've basically, right, at this moment, I've said, no, I, I can't do that. I, I, I don't want there to be a barrier between the listener or viewer, because we are not only podcasting as well as broadcasting, we're, we're video casting on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel called Tell Me Your Story. And I don't want there to be a barrier between the information that we provide, you or anybody else, uh, to those people who want to hear it who maybe need to hear it, you know, and, and I'm not making that judgment by anybody, by any sense. N nobody needs to hear what we're talking about. I'd like for them to listen. I want them to listen, but but that's it's, it's entirely up to them. If they're led to do so, wonderful. If not, that's fine, too. Uh, we lay out a smorgasbord table. And by the way, the table gets bigger every interview. And we put whatever it is that you're serving to us on that table, and we ask people to go check it out. If it doesn't resonate with you, if it if it doesn't feel right for you, all right, don't do it, but get something. And then come back later, because maybe what you took the last time will maybe make you ready for the next thing. You know, I didn't like tomatoes when I was a little kid. I love them today. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there you go. This is Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, along with Ken Gosnell, author of Well Done, and I... I, uh, I I like that phrase. I compliment the people that I work with. Nobody, I have uh, been operations manager at a number of different stations. I have never, ever said these people work for me, mm -hmm. even though I was technically the supervisor. Mm -hmm. We work together because I'm doing the same job they are. 
which helps me, of course, uh, to, to assist them in the process. That seems to be another issue, too, I think, with supervisors who have never done the job of the people they're supervising. And it seems to me that that should be a prerequisite. Even if you go in there, maybe do it for a week or a month, okay? I love the, uh, that one, you know, the Undercover Boss program? I love that program when the CEO of the corporation, especially one that's national or multinational, uh, puts on all the, uh, the, the gear to hide and goes in and, and does some of these jobs and begins to realize what the people he has working for him or with him have to go through and the struggles and the strains. Um, how far should that go in terms of I don't know if it's the, the right word is compassion for the, and I'll, I'll use the term employees uh, or co-workers. Um, how far should that go? I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're living through tough times right now, as they say, with the pandemic. And then, of course, all of the other things that are going on around the world. Help! <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I, I love that show as well uh, because it does em, em really embody uh, what a good, a well-done leader, what I would call a well-done leader looks like. And, you know, there's a principle that we've been practicing in business for many years, and unfortunately we've, for, we've forgotten. It's been practiced in every culture uh, that's ever really uh, graced the face of earth. Uh, it's called the golden rule. Mm -hmm. And I write about that in the book. I say the golden rule works if you work it. And basically, the golden rule says that we should treat other people like we'd want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And I think to your point about business leaders and business owners, it's hard to know how to treat our employees if we've never walked in their shoes. We've never done their job. We've, yeah. never, we've never understood the pressure or the tension that they have to deal with. And that's what that show, uh, Undercover Boss, really illustrates, that when, when the business owner is putting himself in the shoe and, and acting in that role... Now he knows how to treat that individual. And a matter of fact, I encourage business owners uh, to do that, not necessarily undercover, but <laughs> um, you know, you ought to, you know, every, everybody takes vacation and, 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 and work, or you should, you know, try to encourage that. I say, go sit in your, uh, somebody else's seat for a week while they're, while they're on vacation. You're, yeah. If you're, if you own a manufacturing company, go, go work in the back for a week and, yeah. and you know, be that if you're, if you have a, administrative assistant that takes a vacation, you answer the calls for a week and act like, you know, you're the, the administrative individual that's there, or you're the salesperson. Go out and go and go and when they go on vacation, you go fill in their shoes. Now you're not trying to be them. You're not trying to, uh, but you know, do anything other than understand them and you try not to mess it up. I tell them what you have to fix as the supervisor. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> But it's the whole part of understanding, and we've missed this so much in our culture today, or we've missed this so much in our, we, we, don't, we don't consider other people. We don't treat others like we want to be treated. And, and I probably, that's my biggest, I am on social media a lot. Um, and I, I look at social media as an opportunity to, to communicate well done and to share ideas that empower, right? Yeah. It's not a place that we have to tear down others or, oh. or make them feel bad. And I mean, I'm all about having real hard conversations and let's wrestle with difficult moments, right? Mm -hmm. And let's have two different sides. And I believe the diversity makes us stronger. But I don't think we have to be, um, you know, I think the golden rule, uh, I come back to the golden rule works if you work it, can treat other people like you would want to be treated. Yeah. And that means understanding who they are and, and responding them with respect and value. Yeah. Uh, one thing I, I would like to touch upon, a universal principle that I have uh, kind of brought about from those days back in the 80s and 90s that I want to share with you and talk to you about as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, and I hope that you will join us both on the broadcast, the podcast, and the video cast. YouTube is the video cast, uh, SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher Player, FM, Blueberry. <sighs> iHeartRadio and Amazon and many other locations across the uh, depth and breadth and width of the internet. 
I don't know where it begins or ends, but there it is. And then, of course, the broadcast right here on this station, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. on Sundays, 1 a.m. Monday mornings, and 9 a.m. Wednesday mornings. We hope that you'll do that. And if you can support the broadcast and what we're doing here, we would greatly appreciate that. Any amount is welcome through PayPal. It's there for your security as well as ours. And uh, when you go there to send, they're going to ask you for the email address of the one receiving. And that email address is Richard at richarddugan.com so hope that you will take a uh, take advantage of that and join us in uh, the work that we are doing here ken gosnell's my guest and we are talking about well done his latest work ken gosnell is uh, with us and i wanted to uh, share with you a principle uh, I, I call it a universal law now it is actually tied into what you quoted earlier about reaping and sowing the universal law, as I phrase it, is there is always, always, always an exchange. No exception. You can, and, and I know I've heard this phrase before, you cannot outgive God. Well, that is true, but then again, I'm not trying to outgive God. Uh, what I'm trying to do is understand how I can get compensation for the work I've put in. But then, of course, I look at it from this standpoint. You know how people, they'll, they'll give uh, financial contributions, uh, tax deductibles, in order to reduce their tax liability? And that's the reason why they do it. Not because they really care about the charity, but because they want to minimize their taxes. Well, when it comes to the law of exchange, uh, the universe uh, basically says, if there's going to be a giver, there must be a receiver. And if there's going to be a receiver, there must be a giver. You can't have it one way. And uh, so when you hear like at Christmas time, oh, Ken, you, you shouldn't have. No, I can't take this, Ken. No, no, please, please. You are depriving the giver of giving. Uh, you know, that type of thing. But the whole aspect of compensation, this is how I learned this universal principle. When I was working for the Christian station, when I was hiring people and they would start working for us, I'd say, okay, I need you to go in and clean the bathroom. Mm -hmm. You guys don't pay me enough. <laughs> now, I could have gone down that road. I really could have. But I was given the opportunity very early on to do interviews just like this. 30-minute interviews that would run at 7 and 7.30 p.m. during the week. And I began to take a look at getting compensation. Now, I wasn't going to get paid anything extra because uh, I was doing it during my regular eight-hour shift. Mm -hmm. uh, but I started thinking about that. I thought, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I am getting compensation. I'm getting the experience. I'm getting the contact and the relationship. I am getting the materials, whether it's a CD or a book or whatever it is. Um, I'm getting a lot more than they could ever pay me for, for the experience that I'm getting. And that's when I got to that point where I said, uh-uh, I will take the abundance and the prosperity. I will take the exchange in whatever form that it comes in. If it comes in my paycheck, thank you, thank you. If it doesn't, thank you, thank you. Because there's a, there's a beautiful passage from the New Testament that says, Jesus is talking and saying, do you see the birds flying around up there? They don't work. They don't toil. And yet they are cared for. How much more will your father care for you? Talk to us about this principle. Yeah, I love it. Um, you know, I think one of the things that uh, when I talk about a, a team and, and building a better team, I, I say to, the, to all of us that we, uh, are, we become more value when we create more value. And um, it's a principle that I, part of that, you know, I wanted to be, my, my first boss years ago told me in business, he said, Ken, your best ability is your availability. And what he was basically communicating to me way back when, because I worked for a manufacturing company, was, hey, I need you to show up. Uh, that is the very best thing that you can do. And, uh, you know, if you don't show up, you don't get paid, you're not helping the company, right? And that always stuck with me as a, as a foundational principle. But then I thought, well, if I showed up and I did something more, right? If I, if I went a little bit further, then boy, I'd, I'd probably become more valuable to this, to this organization. And so a simple way I used to do it years ago was I'd always figure out what the boss was reading. 
And um, whatever book he had on his desk, I'd go to the local bookstore and I'd get a book, either that same book or I'd get a similar book. And I'd carry it around with me. I'd have it in the cafeteria, the lunchroom, or wherever it was, because I wanted the, the boss or the leader to see that I was caring about the same things that that he was caring about or she was caring about. And, and I wanted them to, to know that think like them. I wanted to start becoming not necessarily acting like them in every aspect, but I wanted to start having a different perspective on it. And that speaks to your point, right? It's it's the fact that um, hey, when when I go, I, I realized that whether the company recognizes it or not, there was something in it for me. I could become a little bit better. I could become a little bit more, um, add more value. And then as I became not only for the company, but I as I became more added more value, I started to become more valuable to myself. And I think that's the that's the point that you're really driving about. And I think that's right right now. That goes to this this heart of it. It's not really about. It's never about the company. It's never about the leader. And unfortunately, there's been a lot of bad companies, and there's been a lot of bad leadership, and there's been a lot of people that have done terrible, terrible things to employees or team members. And and I hate when I see that because I I I believe that they miss. Their, it becomes very short sighted about the business. But I would challenge all of us that it's never about those things anyway. We all have a company of one, right? Which is ourselves. We're all, you know, Ken Inc. or, or Richard Inc. or Bob Inc. or Tom Inc. or Sue Inc. or whoever it is. And so I have to have a perspective that I'm trying to become the most valuable person that I can be. And when I'm valuable, somewhere along the way, somebody else is going to begin to see that value and want that to be a part of their team. I tell you, it's it's uh, wonderful to hear uh, the words you're speaking, and uh, I hope that they go to the right ears. Uh, it's it's something that um, you know. I think that we are all faced with from time to time in our lives, uh, whether we realize it sometimes or not. Uh, and sometimes it's dealing with corporations who have people that are working who didn't make the rules. And this is one of the things that I, I've really worked hard. Sometimes it's, e it's easy, sometimes not so much. When I get on the phone with the people at customer service, mm -hmm. why are you yelling at them, people? Mm -hmm. They didn't make the rules. They didn't set up the protocols, the guidelines, the restrictions, this or that or the other. They're just there. And boy, they have to put up with a lot. And you wouldn't like them calling you. You know, I mean, certainly if you, you get into financial problems, the creditors start calling you and giving you grief and so forth. Um, but the fact of the matter is that that you know, we're all here working together. I've, I've said this many times before, Ken, uh, if the good Lord had intended us for all, for all of us to live solitary lives, I'm pretty sure there are close to 8 billion or more class M planets. Each one of us could occupy it. I mean, the universe is vast. Come on. There are trillions and trillions of stars out there, I'm sure, because I don't know where it ends. I don't know where the wall is. Um, but what's the reality? We're all here. And it tells me that we're all to work together. By the way, the golden rule, I, did, I forgot to mention this. I actually rephrase that a little bit. I say, uh, do unto others as if you were the others. Mm. Um, although I'm not sure how well that would work if you don't feel real good about yourself, if you don't love yourself in that respect, that you would, uh, you would be harmful to yourself. Well, then that's a whole other story. Uh, but I think there's something, uh, there's something to be said for that. I would actually like to address that just a little bit, if, if we can, as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and I thank you for staying with us, along with Ken Gosnell, author of Well Done. I almost said well-being, but there's just a part of that, too, and that's what we want to talk about, uh, well-being. There's a, a passage in the New Testament, uh, uh, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And I ponder that, what does that mean? What does that perfect mean? And and it actually took me back to, to I think it was the Psalms, uh, because I, I thought, okay, God is neither good nor bad, right or wrong, good or evil, black or white. Uh, you know, he is not dual, okay? Uh, God is just God. And in the Old Testament, it says, you know, I am that I am. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, to be perfect like God is just to be. Just be who you are. And it's, it it kind of goes to going within and just pausing 
as one of my guests has said, even if it's just for 60 seconds, just pause. Don't do it when you're driving. Don't do it if it's at, at a red light because it doesn't stay red for 60 seconds, you know. But just be, be, be. Don't move. Don't think. Don't say. Just sit still. Sit calmly. And if the still small voice speaks to you, listen, listen. Let's talk to, let's talk about that in terms of our own uh, self-worth. Self -worth. I don't want to belabor this point, but one other aspect to this is this. If God the Father saw no value in you or I as his children, he never would have set up the sacrifice, right? We had to have had value in the eyes of the Father for there even to be a sacrifice, right? Right, right. So we were priceless even before the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. How much more priceless are we after, after that? Right. By the same token, our egos do tend to get in the way and we start thinking a little haughty. I have to be thankful to the universe for giving me my comeuppance when I get a little bit too <laughs> uppity from my, from my britches. Uh, but talk to us about the concept of self-worth, and, and I'm not sure if we want to use the word appropriate concept or appropriate level, uh, but how do we, what's the best way to monitor that so that we can stay humble, but also recognize, like you, I'm good at what I do, Ken. And that's okay to say, right? Ken? Yeah, I think, um, I, I like to think in that terms of being perfect like our father is being authentic okay. and being, being totally transparent. And, you know, God was, there was a oneness about God. I am who I am. Uh, he was the Alpha and the Omega. He, he's authentically who he is. And I think he's calling us to authenticity. And I tell business leaders today, and, and it's true for all of us, but authenticity is the number one aspect that attracts people to, to a business today, whether it's team members or whether it's customers. They want to go be with a company that is very authentic in who they are. And you're seeing some of that today with businesses where they're trying to wrestle, they're, they're trying to communicate or step into issues that that really aren't related to them because they think that that's going to convey uh, a level of, hey, I'm with this group of people that they want to have as their customer. Mm -hmm. But it comes across as very inauthentic. And I actually think it drives people away from their particular business. And for those businesses that are authentic, then I think it's actually going to be something that draws people, people to them. But I think our value comes from our authenticity, right? I'm, I don't have to be more than what I am. I'm not, I'm trying to be the best that I can be. I recognize where I'm still growing or developing, whether it's as a company or organization or an individual. And I'm honest about those areas of weakness. And when, you know, when we can have that kind of authenticity, uh, then I think it endears people to us. It draws people closer to us. And that's the kind of the example that Jesus did. He didn't have to come in and proclaim that he was king, right? I mean, he, he, it kind of got drew, drew out of him. And then, of course, as he went to the cross and sacrificed himself, he, he acknowledged that he, he indeed was the son of God. But he wasn't around saying, everybody serve me because I'm the king. He was just authentically who he was. He was he humble. Cared, he was humble. He cared about people. He still had all the power that he could, he could create, do miracles, and he could do all those kinds of things. We get into trouble when we, we push into arrogance over authenticity. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and and that's where I think you see a lot of conflict that happens. That's where you see a lot of people, you know, trying to make up more. They tr they don't feel good about themselves, and so they say, "Oh, I've got to be something more." And I know it's a temptation for every leader, every person. But I would just encourage people to push into their authenticity. Right? Know yeah. know their order. Know work the order. Know who they are. Know what they're called to do. Understand their gifts, their purpose, their talent push into that as much as they can, understand their areas of weakness, be humble about that. And then they become this person that everybody wants to come in and support and help. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm the CEO of a company. Oh, look at me. Uh, yeah, but you're not the first, nor will you be the last CEO of a company, okay? So you're, you're not in rarefied air, young man, young woman. Uh, and, um, you know, that's one of the things that, um, like I said, I'm so grateful that uh, I, uh, I am... I am shown those moments when I need to get back into my authenticity, my humility.
but never denigrate. Self-deprecation seems to be also uh, rampant uh, where, um, and I'll put it this way. There are two phrases that signify to, to us, to you and me, about a person's mindset. And it's not the glass half full or half empty. It's, that's not bad. Oh, that's good. Which would you rather hear? I just made a pie. That's good. As opposed to that's bad. I had a guy who uh, worked here at the station. He would come into the production room, record his news. He'd make a mistake. I was down the other at the other end of the hall doing uh, some stuff in there. I would hear screaming and yelling, and he was talking to himself about how <laughs> stupid and dumb and da da da. And the profanity that came out of that room was unbelievable, and it was all self-directed. I thought, wow, you've got a, an incredible voice and talent. You know, um, so uh, yeah, it's it is important to maintain that balance and again that authenticity. This is Tell Me Your Story. Ken Gosnell is my guest. Well done is the book. Welldonebook.com is the website. We will be linked, and we hope that you will click on that link when you go to SoundCloud or any of the other uh, locations, uh, whether it be the uh, the podcast or the video cast. And we hope that you will stay tuned to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and Ken Gosnell is my guest. Ken, uh, before we wrap things up, and uh, I hate to bring this to an end because there's just so much more I would like to talk to you about. Uh, this has just been a lot of fun. I, uh, um, I, I have not been one to sit here with a list of questions. Question one, uh, who is Ken? Uh, why are you here? Um, question two, uh, what about your book? And uh, Tell us about principle 13. Oh, I'm sorry, there are only 12. Oops, I didn't read the book, did I? Um, but I have three final questions that I would like to ask you uh, before we wrap this up. And it's just been a great pleasure to, to converse with you here and share these ideas that are literally, correct me if I'm wrong, Ken, open to everybody. Correct. Yep, correct. Before I ask those three questions, let me share with you, the listener and the viewer, that we are here Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m. We're streaming live at those times at richarddugan.com, as well as the Wednesday edition, which is 9 a.m. Uh, we uh, You can listen then as well at richarddugan.com. The podcasts are on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many other platforms across the Internet. We're also on YouTube where you can watch these interviews. YouTube channel is Tell Me Your Story, surprise surprise and uh, just look for the guy with the hat we hope that you'll subscribe I'm up to a whopping 38 subscribers on uh, YouTube and over 50 uh, I can't can I wish I knew what this really meant I've been podcasting and posting on SoundCloud since January 1 2018 and I have over 50,000 listeners wow. Well done. Well done. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what that means, Ken. I really don't. <laughs> but I'm grateful. I am very grateful. Also, if you can support the work we're doing, folks, we would greatly appreciate that as well. Uh, we'll keep moving forward regardless. But uh, go to PayPal. It's there for your security as well as ours. I love PayPal as a middleman or a person or what have you because uh, uh, it keeps better records than I do. And uh, if you can do that, put in uh, when you send to Richard at richarddugan.com. They're going to ask for an email address, richard at richarddugan.com. Any amount is gratefully accepted and used uh, for the work that we're doing here. And please participate. Uh, even more importantly than the contributions, I ask you to stop and be still, be quiet, just be and listen to that still small voice. So my first of three questions, Ken. Who is Ken Gosnell? Oh, I love it. Hey, I was going to tell you, well done on your hat, by the way. I love it. I need, I need something like that in my wardrobe so I can. I, uh... I, I need to get a new one. This one's dirty. <laughs> <laughs> so, who is Ken Gosnell? And thank you. Right. I, I, the, the simplest question to that is, I, I'm a son of of um, my father and mother who've taught me the principles and values of hard work and to support and encourage other people. Um, I'm right now. I own, I own uh, CEO Experience, which is, uh, I think, one of the most dynamic uh, leadership organizations in the country as we partner and work with leaders. Um, but it, 
But um, the principles that I share are principles that I didn't create. They're principles that have been practiced for the last uh, 100 years and, and probably more than that in, in businesses and around, around the world. But um, the thing that I hope more than anything uh, that people remember is that I just cared about other people and I really wanted them to, to reach their peak performance. And that's what I say. One of the goals that I have is to learn something new every day. And so I'm a learner. Second question, what is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you're doing now? Yeah, we want to start a well done movement. I want those words to be spoken in, in our culture and every business across uh, the country, across the country. I want every employee to hear it. I want every leader to say it. Um, I want every leader to hear it. And ultimately, we want the, the goal, the kingdom impact aspect is when we die and get to heaven, that we hear these words from our maker that he says, well done, good and faithful servant. What you did in your life was significant, was important, what I called you to do, and then enter into your master's happiness for eternity. And finally, what is your life's purpose? Yeah, my life's purpose is to change the world. I wanna help um, and, and do that through Kingdom Impact. I wanna inspire leaders all around the world to be at their very best, and to be a leader that other people want to be like. And that is why we are here with Tell Me Your Story too. We want to change the world as well. And we, we join hands with you, uh, Ken, Ken Gosnell, to, to do that. And, uh, and we can make it happen. We can, uh, you know, and again, I also preface that by saying, that doesn't mean that where we are is awful, terrible, icky. We got to get out of here. No, 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 no. It just means there's always room for improvement. That's right. Ken, thank you so much. This has been fabulous. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate it. Keep up the great work. I, thank well you. done. I, I'm Richard Dugan, and I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. We are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, love to lol.